Hi, I'm Dr. Tracy Marks, the psychiatrist, and I make mental health education videos. Today, I'm talking about avoidant personality disorder, and this is based on a question from D. and here's an excerpt of his question. Would you be willing to talk about avoidant personality in more detail? I'd like to hear more coping skills for it and what kinds of treatment and self-work things I can do myself to help with this. It certainly has a, had a marked impact on my relationships, including both friends and family. Thanks Dee for your question. First, let me define the disorder, and this is based on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fifth edition. An essential feature of avoidant personality disorder is a pattern of being socially inhibited, feeling inadequate, and hypersensitive to rejection or criticism starting by early adulthood. This pattern occurs pervasively, which means that it spreads across all areas of your life. So it's not something that you only noticed after being in a bad relationship with someone who sucked your soul and tore you down emotionally. After a, a relationship like that, you will have some battle wounds that can look like feeling inadequate. Most of the personality disorders, including this one, really start to manifest around late adolescence and early adulthood. And with avoidant personality disorder, you can get hints of social awkwardness and insecurity that seem excessive that the child just doesn't seem to grow out of. Here's the criteria. You need four or more of the seven. Number one, avoids occupational activities that involve significant interpersonal contact because of fears of criticism, disapproval, or rejection. So this would be more than saying, I'll pass whenever you're asked to do something. Your fear of criticism is so strong that you risk being demoted or getting negative evaluations because you're not following through on things that you're expected to do. So let's say you have a monthly activity that involves working closely with people. You don't outwardly say, no, I'm not doing it because it makes me uncomfortable. Instead, you miss meetings under the guise of being sick or late or tied up with something else. You find a way to get out of it without looking like you're being defiant. So you may not get in trouble for your absence, but it still has negative consequences for you because you're missing an action. Number two is unwilling to get involved with people unless you're certain of being liked. With this, you hang on the fringe of society. You're around, but you won't step into the circle and go beyond the superficial with people. Since you're trying to get reassurance that the person likes you first, you end up relying on vibes and intangible body language cues to know whether or not the person likes you. And this thought process of making assumptions about some, what someone thinks is important because it ties in to how to overcome these assumptions. Number three, shows restraint within intimate relationships because of fear of being shamed or ridiculed. In relationships, you keep people at an arm's distance emotionally, and this can look like being afraid to talk about deep things, so you just don't. But a more subtle way you can do this is working all the time or staying too busy. And this isn't entirely conscious, meaning you don't set this up as a strategy to avoid intimacy. Because at a deeper level, you want intimacy, but it's uncomfortable because of these fears you have, so you gravitate toward work and staying busy because that's where you're most comfortable. You tell yourself and the person that you have the relationship with that you can't control your busyness. Number four is preoccupied with being criticized or rejected in social situations. Usually your fixation on this is enough to keep you out of social situations, but if you do go out, you're very uncomfortable because of worrying about what others think of you. This is how avoidant personality disorder can look like social anxiety. I talk about social anxiety in this video, and I'll have a link to this video in the description. Number five is inhibited in new interpersonal situations because of feelings of inadequacy. This can look like shyness. You don't speak much around people or you feel uptight and can't loosen up. And to make things easier on yourself, you just avoid dealing with unfamiliar people if you can help it. But if you can't help it, your inhibitions may make you look awkward. You may stutter 
or not really say what you mean because you're overthinking how you say it or how the person's gonna take it. And this is just an example of how this can look. Number six, view self as socially inept, personally unappealing or inferior to others. You can get to this point if you try and push through your fears and inhibitions and force the social interactions. In other words, you can mount your own evidence to prove this point by reflecting back on your experience. So for example, some people get so anxious that they sweat or choke up when they talk to people. Or let's say you're in a small group because and because you're worrying about what people think, you draw blanks during the conversation and don't know what to say or say the wrong thing that doesn't make any sense. Can you then see how you could draw your own conclusion that you're socially inept? Number seven is unusually reluctant to take personal risks or to engage in any new activities because they may prove embarrassing. This may look like the 38-year-old person who wants so much to find a partner and get married, but can't bring himself to ask out this woman who's sending obvious signals that she's interested. It's the lowest hanging fruit that he'll ever have, and he just can't reach for it. He already knows it will turn into a disaster that he won't be able to recover from emotionally. There is a lot of overlap between social anxiety disorder and avoidant personality disorder. However, with social anxiety, the fear and anxiety is limited to social interactions. And you realize that your fears are, are unreasonable at some level, but you're still anxious about it. And you can still have close personal relationships. But with avoidant personality, there's a deep belief that there's something wrong with you. And because of that, you hyper-focus on subtle cues that people are rejecting or criticizing of you. The threshold for seeing something as critical is very low, meaning it doesn't take much for you to feel insulted or hurt by someone's remarks. Your reaction to this is just to stay away and avoid dealing with people in any way that you can. Now, rejection sensitivity is not unique to avoidant personality disorder. There are other types of people and personalities that are sensitive to criticism. For example, a person with a more aggressive personality style may respond to perceived criticism by attacking others first. Stick it to other people before they stick it to you. That person is not avoiding interactions. They stay in the game and they just fight their way through. But you see the difference there? I just use that example to illustrate that no one likes criticism and not everyone who is sensitive to criticism or rejection responds to it in an avoidant way. With avoidant personality, the avoidance is about avoiding relationships and closeness because of feeling inadequate and fearing rejection or criticism in some form. The treatment for this is cognitive therapy. There may be some behavioral exercises that a therapist can help set up for you, but generally the approach is addressing your distorted beliefs about yourself. I talk about cognitive distortions in this video. I think it would be hard to adequately address this from a self-help approach because you need someone to help you identify some of your distorted thoughts, but you may get by talking through some of your thoughts with a trusted friend. So let's summarize some of the common beliefs that you can have with avoidant personality disorder. You are inadequate. People disapprove of you and wanna criticize you. If someone gets to know you, they won't like you, so you can't expose yourself to them. Your feelings aren't safe around others because they will mock you. These are a starting place for you. If you can identify with these, then write them down. Then, to add more of your own thoughts, think about situations that have caused problems for you, like the examples that I gave with work and needing to um, interact with small groups and things like that. Have you had trouble at work because of your assumptions about what people are thinking? Take an inventory of your relationships. Do you have close friends? Do you have a romantic partner? Most people with avoidant personality disorder are deeply lonely, but they lack the desire to do the things that it takes to get close to someone because of how uncomfortable it makes them feel. 
So part of getting past that is being resolved to deal with the discomfort to get to the end goal. That means you should expect the process to be hard and you'll have to keep going at it. But I will say, in looking for a partner, you'll probably be more suited for someone who's more emotionally hands-off like you are. You, you won't do well with a person who's more emotionally needy and wants a lot of your attention. You can improve in this area of being more revealing of yourself, but you can only go so far with it. So you don't need someone who's pressing you all the time to talk and share your feelings. Identifying what's behind your behavior is an important step and gives you insight, but then you need to challenge your beliefs. And that's the part that may not be so easy to do on your own. In this video, I give you one way to challenge your distorted beliefs. There are other ways to challenge beliefs, but with avoidant personality disorder, I think you need someone to help you navigate through it. Another thing that can help with avoidant personality disorder is skills training. This would be getting help with having conversations or how to carry yourself in public. You could also get help from on how to nurture a relationship. For example, asking people questions and following up on their answers. This shows that you're interested in them and you can learn how to reveal things about yourself so people can feel close to you. Also with skills training, you can get feedback on what are appropriate things to share with people. So there's a lot here. And I do think that even if you don't have a therapist, understanding what holds you back can still help you make some changes to improve your relationships. Thanks again, Dee, for the question. See you next time.